Birmingham is the UK's second largest city, but is often upstaged by its noisy neighbour to the north, Manchester, the country's third largest metropolis. Birmingham has not always been synonymous with good architecture. Having fully embraced the post-war reconstruction era, its iconic concrete bullring centre became a symbol of all that was bad about brutalism and contributed heavily to the popular conception that Birmingham was a concrete jungle of shopping centres and motorways. That's all changing now. Future System's new Selfridges store, whilst not universally liked, has changed the image of the city for good. Now Birmingham's homegrown architect, Ken Shuttleworth's firm, Make, is opening another landmark building, The Cube. In our exclusive interview, we talk to Ken, his project architect, Francis Gannon, and client, Neil Edgington, director of Birmingham Development Company. So thank you very much everybody for being here and welcome. Um, Ken, before we talk about the Cube, uh, can you tell us a bit about Birmingham um, for our overseas viewers? Uh, has it had some image challenges in the past? Yeah, I was brought up in Birmingham. I was, um, I was born there and I spent the first 18, 20 years of my life there. <clears throat> and it was an industrial city. It was very much a sort of city that was um, or an industry. I mean, the, the Industrial Revolution changed Birmingham completely into a sort of industrialised city. Um, and my, all my relatives came down from north of England into Birmingham in the sort of 19th century to, to work in factories. Um, so when I was a boy being brought up there, it was just full of smoke and we used to wear masks going out to the streets. It was, you know, a real sort of industrial heartland of, um, of Britain, which was great at the time. Um, but now it's all, all that's gone. I mean, virtually, I think all the industry pretty much has gone. There's only a few factories left. Um, and it's completely different. It's more, it's, it's had a sort of almost you know, derelict areas of Birmingham um, over the years, which are now being, gradually being upgraded. But for, for many years, when the industry went, it had a sort of, there was a lull, basically, what was actually happening in Birmingham. Um, and I think, and I left in um, 1976 and came down to London. Um, and during that time period, since I left, there's only been, um, one decent piece of architecture built <laughs> in that time, um, which was the Selfridges building, um, which is great, great building. But I mean, I think it, you know, it suffered from not, not sort of having a, the impetus that was there, I suppose, before I left in the 50s was fantastic. You know, they were building new roads, they were building new libraries. It was a um, tearing down old Victorian buildings, which were all sort of, you know, um, looking back on quite nice, but at the time felt really sort of old fashioned. And it had this sort of really brave new world of new architecture and new, new things happening up in the 1950s and 60s. And then it sort of stopped. And there was a big gap for sort of 20 years before Selfridges was built. Mm. So I think over the time it, it's really sort of evolved, you know, from being industrial, post industrial, with brand new architecture to sort of a lull. And now there's now a new, I'd say, a new renaissance mm. really in terms of the way that Birmingham's regenerated with Selfridges, with the queue, <coughs> there was a new library going up. Um, it's a complete transformation over that sort of time period. So in the last 50 years, it's changed yeah. totally. Yeah. So bearing those uh, points in mind, what were the key elements for the brief, for the design of the cube? Um, I don't know. Was there a brief? I, no. <laughs> I, I don't think there was a brief other than... Can, here's, here's a site with a red line around it. We, we want to add to Birmingham's architecture, which, as Ken's just explained, um, wasn't too difficult actually because there's not too many great buildings so it was about raising the profile um, so it was probably the loosest bridge you've ever looked at wasn't it yeah I think it was just I think it was about you know responding to the site and I think um, you know we felt very strongly the site needed a, needed a very um, powerful uh, building I think other architects did towers and things we didn't feel the tower was right for that site um, we felt it should be a sort of mid-rise building um, and sort of work you know with the whole site so I think the brief the brief sort of evolved over time. I, I can't remember ever seeing a brief um, in reality. <laughs> um, but it was just there was a site, you know, what, what should we do on that site? So I think, it, as, as uh, Neil said, I think it was, it was open in a way. Yeah. And I think it sort of evolved about um, you know, Neil and the team really wanted, um, 
really felt mixed use skiing was the way it was the way to go, mm -hmm. um, which is unusual in the UK. Yeah. In Europe, it's not so unusual. In, in continental Europe, it's not unusual. In, in the UK, to have a mixed use building vertically stacked is very unusual. The, the lack of a brief was quite. Um, <clears throat> quite intentional as well. Yeah. So we say it in jest, but what we didn't want to do actually is there's all these um, talented folk, you know, who uh, design all these great buildings around the place, and then as developers we tell them what we want, you know, and it just stifles all the creativity. So we were absolutely desperate not to do this um, on the site of the cube and actually allow some freedom. So uh, we, di we didn't even provide any planning policy guidance or anything. We just said, you know, put that to one side a minute. What would you do as a fantastic building? Because if it is truly fantastic. We'll get consent for it. We'll all believe in it, you know. So, uh, so it wasn't that we were just too lazy to write a brief. <laughs> so, Neil, the uh, the project's been five years in the making, and and a lot has happened in that time. Um, has the financial turmoil been has it, has it affected the design in any way? And I guess with that, I mean sort of, despite the financial turmoil, look at look at this building. I mean, what a project. Yeah, I think. It, um, when you take on projects like the Cube that span over, okay, it's been five years so far, but we've just built it now, we've probably got another five years mm -hmm. to bring it to life, fill it up with the tenants and everything else. So these things take, you know, 10 years, which is a big chunk of your, of your working life. Mm -hmm. um, and I think you have to accept that there'll be ups and downs in the process. The Cube has been a roller coaster. There have been ups and downs. Um, the, the first one, of course, being we ended up setting a construction company up to build the Cube because uh, local contractors wouldn't touch it, felt it was too risky put big risk premiums on. So, you know, we had to find innovative ways to try and overcome all of these challenges. It's fair to say none of us saw this global economic crisis coming. Um, but, uh, but again, when you've got a project that's spanning a cycle, you know, started at the peak of a cycle, I think you have to accept that values can go either way. Um, one thing we've been absolutely true to, um, and hopefully Francis and Ken agree, is um, not dumbing down the design and uh, and actually keeping the bits that are precious yeah. to the architect. And that's not to say we've not come back to, uh, to Ken Francis and everybody else at Make saying, we can't afford this bit, how do we do it a bit differently? But it's certainly not been a project that's been value engineered. So I don't think the design has suffered actually as a No, as I don't think Neil's actually. Yeah. So I mean, I, don't, I, don't think, I think Neil's right, I don't think we had actually, I can't remember any sort of value engineer that really sort of affected the design. I mean, I think that they, they were very keen to, um, Neil and Tim were very keen to hang on to the scheme and not. You know, like take away the screen, for instance, which would obviously be an obvious thing to do. Um, if you try and sort of make it more um, more efficient, there's lots of other things you would do, but that never actually happened. So the scheme stayed true to the first sketches, to the first models, um, right from the beginning. I, I don't think Francis that's right. I mean, yeah, absolutely. There was, um, and, uh, there was a real team approach about making the building work. So um, if the appraisals weren't working out, the answer wasn't always to cut costs, but it was to look where we could find more value mm. to make the sort of developers balance sheet work um, and I think the way that all of the design team, the developer and the cost consultants were all co-located in one office right from the beginning of the project meant yeah. that we really worked as a team in a way that <coughs> I think is quite difficult to achieve on many projects but there was a real team approach to solving problems whatever, who, whoever's problem it was, everybody was, was looking for the solution. You definitely couldn't escape anybody else's problem because they were sitting next to you. So. <laughs> And can you tell me a bit about the tenants? Who's who's going to be inside Cube? Um, well, it is a truly mixed-use building. There's there's um, every use you can think of put in this put in this one place. So <coughs> we've got retail, we've got restaurants, offices, residential, a hotel, and a rooftop restaurant. So uh, our very first tenants into the building are the Highways Agency, who have now got 700 staff based um, in the in the Cube's there, West Midlands headquarters, which is great. Mm -hmm. So that's half of our office space gone. Um, there are a couple of restaurant deals just in the making at the moment. The rooftop restaurant has been let to um, a company called D and D London, who were formerly Conlon and Partners, and uh, we've just signed the hotel, which we're hoping we c we can announce in two weeks' time. So uh, watch this space. Right. Right? So there's a 52 bed boutique hotel that we uh, will be announcing very shortly. Mm. Terrific. Wonderful. Yeah. That's good stuff. Um, Ken, in the 70s and 80s, Birmingham was very heavily focused around the car. Um, mm -hmm. How does the Cube address this sort of now, I suppose, unfashionable aspect, if you will? Um, I think, in a way, the, the outside of the building is a sort of image of the, sort of the industrial past of it, and the car manufacturers are also part of 
Birmingham was a sort of place, you know, think all, the, all, the, all the big major um, car manufacturers are based in Birmingham. So the outside of the building has a sort of patina which reflects sort of heavy metal, heavy um, sort of machine-like uh, part of Birmingham, which I think is important. But I mean, on the site itself, we were very keen to make the car disappear, um, so that the car is actually, you go down, you go through a hole, and basically disappears into a sort of um, labyrinthine um, sort of world of, of whirling uh, lights and, um, and sort of moving ramps. So the car is actually like a sort of, it goes, it's treated like a machine in a way, the car goes into, into a hole, and it just disappears into this sort of library. And then you push a button, and it comes out again. Um, so there's no great sort of, no great ramps going down. There's no, there's no sort of, you know, large sort of engineers type turning circles and things which take a lot of space. So it's very much a sort of engineered solution. In a way, Birmingham is about engineering. And in a way, the car park solution here, which is um, probably the biggest in the UK, mm -hmm. not in Europe, um, which is a sort of automated system. It just, just basically just happens by magic um, <laughs> below the car, below the sort of ground floor space. So I think it's a it's a very Birmingham solution, actually, to yeah. sort of hop, you know, to try and use it to um, use it in an engineering way and not sort of express it. I mean, in the 60s, all those big expressways that were built in Mass House Circus, and some of them have been torn down already mm. uh, and reduced back down to ground level. So I think there's been a, there's been a sort of love hate relationship with the car in Birmingham. Um, I think it's moving more towards pedestrianisation. I mean, you can walk from the cube um, all the way around in a huge circle, um, past the sort of civic quarter, down through to the rotunda. Um, you know, down New Street without actually crossing a road. You know, it's a, become a much more civilised place to be than it was in the, in the 50s and 60s. Mm. I think on a micro scale, <coughs> where, um, where you know, it is a city and there does have to be some cars and there has to be delivery vehicles and all that sort of stuff, uh, Francis in particular has worked with the city council, so where there are roads leading up to the queue, one, one of the elevations fronts onto a road, we've put half a million pounds into a big public square there and traffic calming and trees and all those sort of nice things to try and try and stop it being a rat runner to try and you know make the car the second priority mm -hmm. and make the pedestrian the priority yeah, yeah it's on three sides it's pedestrianized so it's you know, it's part of a sort of pedestrianized world in a way and there's a pedestrian route that goes all the way through it as well so it's, a, it's more pedestrian based mm -hmm. and car yeah. based the scheme and is that something that's part of a big a bigger picture a bigger plan for birmingham sort of the pedestrianization and part of the regeneration, would you say? I think so. Birmingham has sort of historically quite a small city centre and that's expanding sort of quite rapidly. And the cube is a kind of gateway to a new quarter of the city that's been there's a lot of new apartment buildings and development. So there's mm -hmm. a huge new population that um, the cube is between that new population and the city. So the cube offers a route to the city centre network. It's sort of like a gateway to finding your way on that. So the um, planning moves that we made to mm. improve the streets was all about opening up that route and encouraging people to find their way onto this pedestrian network. So the planning of the Cube um, site is really all about drawing people in and through and around the building. And this has been a <coughs> this has been a sort of forgotten part of the city for many years actually, until ten years ago when the Mailbox scheme acted as a catalyst to sort of bring people over to that side of town. So previous studies have always looked at. Um, the, the sort of easterly and the southerly parts of the city, so the Bud study in the 80s and the Hildebrand study, were about pedestrianising quarters and creating public squares and routes between these squares, but forgetting the west side of the city where the, where the cube is, just because mm -hmm. there was no need to think about it at the time. The development was all over there. Mm -hmm. So um, we worked with, um, with Macon City Council to try and actually do a pedestrian study for this part of town and, and actually link routes back up again that had been forgotten over time. So, uh, you know, the, the canal towpaths being widened, there's cameras linked back to control rooms to make it a safe place to walk around and all that sort of stuff. Is, I mean, the Cube is, is obviously going to become one of Birmingham's landmarks, Birmingham's landmark. Um, and has this always, how does this fit in with Birmingham's <coughs> overall plans? I mean, is this sort of part of the, uh, in the sort of redevelopment of, of Birmingham, you were talking about the east and then the west. Yeah, I, mean, I, think, I think there's been a, a new ambition in a way to sort of mm -hmm. relaunch Birmingham with the, the self building the Cube and now with the library and a few other projects as well and big city plan to actually make Birmingham into a, uh, a 21st century city, you know, to, to move ahead of, in a way of the competition. Um, so I think the Cube is very, 
you know, it's very poignant right now in terms of the um, the relaunch of Birmingham. This building will be be spotted all over the world. It will be sorry, spotted. It will be shown all over the world in various yeah. architectural magazines and television programs and things. So I mean, it will become a uh, a famous building for Birmingham. Yeah. And I think that's really um, a catalyst in, in terms of the, the rest of the development. So I think the library will you know equally become that as well. So I think it's uh, it's part of a, a trio of half decent buildings <laughs> in, in Birmingham. Good buildings in Birmingham. <laughs> And um, the building's achieved um, a rating of excellent for the Briam uh, system. What does that mean to you as a client? Um, <clears throat> we, we focused with the design team um, very early days. How do we actually do all this sustainability stuff and the green stuff that everybody talks about, but not just make it a box ticking exercise? How do we make it meaningful? Because if we really can um, spend some capital to make sure that life cycle costing is, uh, is made more sensible. Tenants actually do realise some value out of the money we're spending. Why wouldn't you do it? So um, we, we focused definitely on the Brian points that we thought actually weren't just ticking a box, but were, were adding meaningful benefits to the building. Um, and obviously taking the offices, they've achieved an energy performance certificate rating of B as well. So what it, what it actually means to the, to the building and to us is um, it's another USP for the Cube. The Cube is the only building in Birmingham, new builds, that's achieved a brand excellence. So when we're let into office space, um, it's you know it's a really important point, and you, you can you can demonstrate those benefits. And actually, at the time, I was agency cleaner, public sector tenants. It was it was very big on their priority list, and it probably was one of the uh, the deciding factors for them. Mm -hmm. I mean, from our point of view, having green excellence is sort of is a sort of starting point. Really, I think it's. You know, we um, are all about projects trying to <coughs> achieve the most energy efficient project we possibly can. Um, and the cube, you know, with its sort of lots of solid panels rather than lots of glass panels, um, highly insulated uh, scheme. And the fact that we've got a mixed use actually helps as well with the energy side. Mm -hmm. So, so the the, um, the building has been designed around trying to minimise the amount of energy we use in the project. So there's a completely separate building actually that sits alongside the cube where all of the plant is. So the, the energy centre, building B as it became affectionately known, um, provides all of the, the, um, the boilers, the chillers, the water, everything else to every tenant. So it reduces tenants' capital expenditure. They just plug into our systems. And of course, it's cheaper to run half a million square feet than it is if you're a 2,000 square foot shop unit or something. So there's economies of scale. Francis, this is your baby, really. What Can you tell us a bit about the, the DNA of the Cube? Well, I have um, been working on this project from day one, which is a really fantastic experience. Um, and I think the strength of the, the concept and the, the sort of the material logic of the scheme has really carried us through um, the the cube is a simple idea and the material choices of the you know the strong jewel box outside and then the colourful glassy fragmented jewellery inside the box has sort of made all sorts of design decisions easy. Everyone's bought into that, as we were saying. It's sort of weathered all sorts of challenges. Um, and then all those little decisions, even down to what colour are the front doors and what's the pattern on the carpet and the choice of door handles and stuff. There's a logic there that makes all those decisions very easy. Um, and the lovely thing was when the decisions weren't just left to us, but suppliers and subcontractors would say, you know, I've got this in square. You know, and they, they would have really sort of bought in because the, the building is, um, I think, easy to understand on that conceptual level. Um, and then the, the um, challenge has been to try and heighten or accentuate that contrast. So, you know, the bit where the, the fretwork screen meets the cladding of the courtyard, you know, it's just so exciting that that's where you really get that strong contrast, like the way that the sort of pointy ears at the corner peek up above the cube, it's those points for me that are the most satisfying where you get the, that inside and the outside coming together. Would you, would you have done anything differently? Um, I don't think so. I think the, I mean there's, there's perhaps some sort of, I don't know, small choices or something, but every decision has a story behind it and politics behind it. And when you think of everything that we went through as a team to achieve this, um, no, I don't think there's much I'd change. I think um, it would have been nice to have some renewable technologies on site, and we worked really hard looking at borehole cooling, for example, which is something the Environment Agency were really behind us mm -hmm. on. 
but the sort of time scales and cost involved in that meant that it just didn't work at this point in time. But I, I uh, keep the hope that maybe in the future there's a time where we can drill some wells in the basement. Obviously, we have this enormous headroom because of the car parking system. So we could drill some wells in the future, and then the chillers, you know, just get unplugged effectively. So I think it's a building that has a lot of um, life in it, and a lot of flexibility and adaptability that you know it can meet challenges in the future as well. And there's no there's no roof over the atrium. Is that always part of the initial design? Mm. Yeah. Yeah, I think it's always important. So it's a courtyard. It's not an atrium. Yeah. So yeah. The, the the rain water goes all the way down to the bottom. I think it's it's a much more um, it's a better experience, I think, to walk into a building where you you actually you know in the in the outside. I think it's it's a stronger link to nature, stronger link to what's going on in, in the world around you, rather than being a sort of you know sort of mal sealed shopping centre. I mm -hmm. think these, it's a much more um, more vital experience to be part of the sort of weather. So if it's pouring down the rain, I think the fact there's rain dripping down is fantastic. And there's a there's a grill at the bottom to take it away, but it's um, <laughs> you know I think it's part of the experience. There's a lovely view where you can, especially when it's raining, you see the water falling to the bottom of the courtyard, and then you can look out and see that it's actually lower than the canal, and mm. you realise you're really kind of sunk in the ground mm. there. Would, um, would you call the cube a, um, a catalyst for regeneration? Yeah, I, I think in the area, you see exactly where this is. I mean, the mailbox, um, as Neil was saying, is, is on the sort of west side, and people don't normally go there. Mm. Um, it's become a sort of, you know, it's been a kind of draw. The mailbox in itself has become a draw to people going there. Um, and in a way, this is like the pivotal point at the end of that, which then, um, you know, dresses the, the whole hinterland around it. So I think, you know, there has already been, I think there's a building called the Post Box thing. Next to there is, yeah. Um, so it's already had its own little ripple effect. Uh, I think it will have a bigger ripple effect as, you know, as time goes on. There's a lot of yeah. land around that that could be developed. Yeah, I think um, <clears throat> certainly what we set out to do wasn't necessarily to be a catalyst for redevelopment and regeneration on the west side of town because over the last 10 years the west side has seen some regeneration but we absolutely set out with the ambition of making it a catalyst for Birmingham to embrace international architecture and hopefully that's, that's what it's done and um, seeing it now joined in the city with, um, you know, as Ken mentioned, the library project and the new street station, Selfridges. Um, you know, hopefully that's, that is a new era for the city. Looking forward, there's been some exciting uh, revelations in the news about um, the twinning of Abu Dhabi and Birmingham. Um, what does this mean for the future of, of Birmingham and the future of architecture in Birmingham? Um, architecture, hopefully, will mean more uh, exciting, more sort of international buildings. I think it's, it's an amazing um, you know, initiative to bring Abu Dhabi and Birmingham together. Um, you know, completely different. When you go to Abu Dhabi and go to Birmingham, you know, they're different, you know, different types of city. But there's more people living in Birmingham than in Abu Dhabi, so it's sort of it's interesting. Um, there's obviously going to be a cross flow of information between the two. So hopefully, I think it'd be a really positive thing. I think um, you know Abu Dhabi's got the funds, and what they're hoping is that Birmingham's got the knowledge. You know, it's had to learn a lot in the last 20, 30 years to um, to, to to revitalise itself as a city. Um, City Council is the largest um, local authority in Europe, so um, it, you know, it has learned a lot of lessons all by itself. And the leader, Mike Whitby, um, is very, very strong on the international links. And, um, and, and I think it can only be positive for the city. There's already now uh, Middle East investors coming into Birmingham, sovereign funds coming into Birmingham. Um, there's a big project about to start called Bjorn in the Digbeth part of town. Um, which is exactly that, you know, it's, it's new money coming into the city, new investment, so um, in that sense it can only be positive. Well, thank you very much for sharing your, your thoughts and your opinions on, on uh, Birmingham and, and also the Cube, and uh, yeah, that's it. Thank, thank you, you very, very much. much. <laughs>